One of my heroes, and I have many, is the Jesuit priest, Father Gregory Boyle. The work he does with gang members in the streets of Los Angeles is to me truly inspiring. He helps those gang members, most of whom were neglected, mistreated, or abandoned by their parents, to find healing in a safe place. He helps them know their dignity and to find hope as the beloved children of God that they are. In Father Boyle's most recent book, The Whole Language, he tells of a visit to one of the worst prisons, Pelican Bay, which houses inmates that were deemed the most violent or hardened. The prison had organized a performance by the wonderfully talented piano player Eric Genoas, who brought a little string section with him. Eric's plan was to play for 45 minutes, then open the floor to questions. Eric began to play, and the music touched each person gathered. They were all held in silence, deeply moved. Soon the, the prisoners were all sobbing and the guards discreetly wiping their own tears. When he finished, Eric turned to ask if there were any questions and there was only silence. Eventually, one gang member, his face covered in tattoos, rose. He had something to say, but he was still crying, so it was hard for him to speak. He finally could utter his one word question, why? And when he heard the question, why, the musician Eric understood what was being asked and he began to cry as well. And he said, because you are deserving. You are worth beauty and music, and there is no difference between you and me. That moment, that encounter, is exactly what Jesus prayed for on the night before he died, when he prayed that we would be one, that is the peace that Jesus offered his early disciples that same night. And that is the peace to which Jesus invites us. We tend to think of peace as maybe the absence of war. In places like Ukraine right now and other places, that alone would be a step. But Jesus invites us to something much more profound than the absence of violence. He invites us to true peace. And what does the peace that Jesus invites us look like? It looks like that moment when this musician saw and named the truth. How much more alike we are than different. And when for a moment in that prison hall, everyone was one. Getting to that place of, of peace and unity is really tough. I mean, today's first reading shows that it was tough from the beginning, right? This is the, this is the early days of the church, shortly after Jesus had died, really. It was tough from the get-go, right? The early disciples of Jesus were Jews, deeply steeped in Jewish tradition. Their practices and traditions had been handed down by their parents and their parents' parents. And as they understood it, one simply could not be a follower of Jesus 
without first being a Jew. But God stirred Peter's heart to a bigger and more inclusive love. What he had been taught by his mom was no longer adequate. In the large mercy of God, the distinction between slave and free, Jew and Gentile, clean and unclean, didn't work. God's love is large and expansive and includes Gentiles. All. Some traditions are too small and fearful, not nearly big or bold enough for God's love for this world. But getting there was such a hard transition and always will be. We can tell that it was tough from the beginning by this, this one line from this piece of scripture. There arose among them no little dissension. No little dissension. Peter, thank goodness, listened to God and to God's broader and more inclusive love of all. And in holding that vision, Peter became part of the answer to Jesus' prayer. When Jesus prayed on the night before he died, and when he prays now, he does not pray that we will all think the same, pray the same, vote the same. No, Jesus prays that we will be one, that we will, we will keep our unity even in the midst of our disagreements. And my friends, you and I are called also to be a part of the answer to the prayer of Jesus. We, like Peter, must be about the work of unity and avoid those things that make distinctions about who is in and who is out, right? Between us and them are any of the ways we tend to divide people. To get there, we will each need some humility and awareness that we only know part of the truth because that's all we know. And two, we need to nurture a reverence for each other to actively and regularly remind ourselves that God lives in each person, that God lives in each person. Because God does. And three, when we disagree, we need to do so with respect. How we disagree matters profoundly. Even if I am convinced I am right, it is never okay to communicate in a way that brings disunity. I hope you realize that that's one of the purposes of Sunday Mass. This is a place where we practice that unity, that love. It's a school of love and unity, so to speak. I mean, it might be easier to sometimes pray in the woods, and I love doing that. But it is important that we gather here. All are welcome. There might be some places where only certain groups are welcome, right? People of a certain skin color, political party, sexual orientation, income level. Not here. For not only did, did Jesus pray that we would be one, he continues to pray for that right now. As Father Gregory Boyle said in that same chapter, inclusion is God. Separation is not. It must have been quite a moment in that prison. All those varied people in that same room, hardened members of opposing gangs, prison guards, a classically trained piano player in his string section, all thrown together in the sterile setting of that prison hall. Yet the Holy Spirit stirred through the love that was in that music. And when through his tears that gang member asked his 
one word question, why? God spoke through Eric those profoundly true words. Because you are deserving. You are worthy of beauty and music. Because there is no difference between you and me. This very moment, Jesus continues to pray that we will be one. May we too be instruments of the peace for which he prays.